I'm Neil Patterson, and on this special edition of the Sky News Daily, we'll be taking a look back at 2023 in politics. Yep, look, unlike 2022, we certainly didn't have three separate prime ministers. There were no lettuces, there was no economy-wrecking mini-budget, but we certainly had plenty of twists and turns. Here to hold my hand and walk me through the trauma, our political editor, Beth Rigby, who, oh. I should state, for those of you who are listening and not watching, yes. is very remarkably Christmassy in her choice of attire. That is a very spangly top. I am wearing uh, one of my Christmas jumpers. I am fully in Christmas mode for this occasion and Neil just doesn't have the memo. And uh, anyway, I am in full Christmas mode. Yeah, I can tell. Demob happy, I, I would say. Um, I am. Well, let, let's, let, let's start as we should um, in 2023 with, with the government. And, mm. and, and at least we have a list of pledges on which to judge Rishi Sunak. Do. Having inflation, growing the economy, bringing down national debt, sorting out NHS waiting lists and stopping the boats. Mm. Has he had any success? He has had some success, Neil. And, and I liked your intro a lot. And... You know, when you were going through the kind of various car crashes that we were watching in slow-mo last year... I'm still traumatised. But this year also has been full of drama. I mean, it has not been the sort of boring, stable government, if you like, that maybe people thought Rishi Sunak uh, might bring to number 10. Well, that he promised. Let's yeah. Let's forget. That he promised. It was meant to be steadying the ship... Mm. The polls were meant to close. The gap between the parties was meant to close. He's meant to bring order. Anyway, we can get into all of that. But you're right. He kicked off the year. And I remember it well because it was before Parliament <laughs> had come back and we'd just done Christmas. And, you know, because you've got a little boy, mm. you know how full on Christmas are with with family. I loved it. And, um, and then Rishi Sunak kicked off the year, the first week of jam. We're all meant to be recovering from Christmas. And he announced these big five pledges. This was his big, this is who I am as prime minister. Uh, this is what I make the promise to the country. Uh, this is my promise to the country. And um, where have we got to through the year? It's a very mixed bag. Well, take us it's there. It's a I very mean, mixed some, bag. I, we've, we've, had some, we've had some positive so, movement some, on inflation. Yes, so... I had I had a quick look through these before I came in because we've got this great pledge tracker on Politics Hub. Little plug there. Did you see what I did? Uh, Check the guy, the guy that runs that's given me ten quid for that, Neil. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, where where are we? Inflation. Okay, so inflation, it's in the green. He's he's achieved that. Inflation has halved. Uh, to where it was in January, it's four point six percent as of October. So that's a big tick. The next one, the economy, work in progress, I would mm. say. Um, it hasn't grown in the three months to October. But there is an expectation that the, the final quarter of the calendar year mm. will see a bit of uptick in When you growth. can always expect so, it to so, be more spending. Yeah, so he can maybe claim that uh, next year. Uh, reduced debt, no, it's rising relative to GDP. And then there's the two that I would argue at the more retail end of the offer, mm -hmm. that is on the NHS and on stopping the boats. And on both of those, I would say they are very much... Actually, on the NHS, it was very much in the red zone. Mm -hmm. Very... I mean, I, that pledge is... I don't think... I can think I can say this with some confidence. I don't think he's going to hit that pledge. But he would say, well, the reason for that is the doctors. It's yeah, the well, nurses. Make, striking. Well, well, then, you know, the counter... The counter argument to make to that is, as Prime Minister, if that is your pledge and you've got a series of strikes, maybe don't make that pledge, don't choose that to be one of your five things, or try and do a deal with the doctors and nurses. And again, it really matters to people, right, because it's their hip operation or it's a, a non-emergency of an operation that they need uh, and they're having to wait. And, and that's a very tangible frustration for people. Um, 
and then stop the boats. Well, this is this is the one yeah. I think we're going to spend a bit of time talking about because do, not also, just us, Neil. Well, the, the entire <laughs> nation, the entire nation, well, apparently the ent- cannot talk of anything else, according to the prime minister. Maybe you'll have a view on that. <laughs> but I suppose, as well as stopping the small boats crossing the channel, this does also play into immigration policy in yeah. general. Twenty twenty three, of course, the year in which we hit mm. record mm. highs mm. in terms of net migration, a figure approaching three quarters of a million people coming to this country. Why is the Conservative government in such a mess over migration, legal or otherwise? I mean, you and I have talked quite a lot about this, and I think mm. there's there's a couple of things to say. I think that Rishi Sunak made Stop the Boats, illegal migration, one of his five pledges, so it, 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 it rapidly rose up the agenda. Now, his advisers would say, well, there was no option because it matters to voters and it particularly matters to conservative voters. Mm -hmm. So say it's in the top three of uh, many voters' concerns. With many conservative voters, you'll find it's their top concern, right? So it's partly a, I can't ignore this issue because I will suffer at the polls if I ignore this issue. I think the second longer-term reason for this is that the whole... Um, drive of take back control, the mantra of the 2019 election on which Boris Johnson like sailed to victory with an 80 seat majority um, was about controlling borders. Mm -hmm. And the Conservative Party made a pledge in that 2019 manifesto that it would get um, uh, net migration down below, I think it was about a quarter of a million people. See, I, I'm old enough to remember David Cameron making promises in that direction way back, mm. you know, way back at was the Was that the beginning. tens of thousands? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you've then had a period post-Brexit mm. where um, immigration, migration, it's just gone to record levels. So there's a massive issue here for the Conservative mm-hmm. Party. So you made a manifesto pre- pledge, you have not just broken it, you've smashed through the barriers of it. Um, It's agitating your supporters. And then you have this very visual symbol Mm. of uncontrolled immigration, the exact opposite of take back control of migrants, asylum seekers coming across the channel in boats in their thousands. And it's really exploded as a problem in the past three to four years. But but the way in which this government has chosen to handle it is not by dealing with the issues in terms of processing asylum claims. It is not in terms of sorting out return agreements, you know, agreements with other countries Mm. so you can send people back, although they have done that Mm. with with Albania with, Mm. with, with some effect. Instead, they have promoted this Rwanda repatriation Mm. policy, deporting people to a foreign country if they arrive here illegally for their asylum claim to be processed there. And it has caused him problems, not just with the Mm. public, but also within his own party. It was interesting around the Rwanda vote Mm -hmm. of that was the second reading. That's effectively what that is, is the principle. Do you accept the principle of a piece of legislation, in this case, how to clamp down on Mm -hmm. illegal immigration and and, and be able to send people to Rwanda. Um, You know, that vote, what was interesting was when he spoke to rebels the morning of the vote as he was tempting to see off this rebellion, in that breakfast, as I understand it, he spent some of the time trying to blame predecessors for the problem he inherited, right? I don't know how well that went down in the room. I don't think they particularly appreciated this sort of uh, passing the buck to other people. He was, he was Chancellor but, at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, he was Chancellor, and, and certainly Suella Bravman and her allies would say, well, we put forward lots of policies when you were Chancellor and then Prime Minister that you didn't want to accept. But the, po- the, the point is, and this is what I think is... I think it's bad... I'm going to call it... I think it's bad politics... <laughs> on number 10's part, because he has somehow, by accident, I would hope rather than design, because if it's by design, I'm totally confounded, has made a policy that he doesn't really know if he can deliver because it's beyond his control in some areas. The totemic policy now of his migration plan, when it's something that has irreconcilably divided his party like Brexit did between effectively left and right. So leave, remain, Mm -hmm. left and right of the party, all having a row about whether we pull out of human rights uh, obligations internationally, right? And he's made this 
like his hill to die on. And I'm like, they might kill you. And, and no doubt what happens, you know, in 2024, the beginning of 2024, will have an effect on, on approval ratings, which right now, as I understand it, I mean, Rishi Sunak is polling worse yeah. right now than Boris Johnson mm. did immediately before the party booted yeah. him. Yeah. Compare and contrast, though, with mm. where Labour are at the moment, mm. massively ahead in the polls. I mean, mm. you know, we can we can talk mm. about um, we can talk about uh, Keir Starmer's mm. kind of personal mm. approval ratings, but but the party is mm. significantly ahead. Is that because people are appreciating, you know, the, the the possibility that Labour could do things better, or is it you know pure and simple Rishi Sunak fatigue, Conservative fatigue? Do you think? I think that basically, it's a combination of a few things, but if you boil it down to the very basics, I would say that this is not what I would say, actually, this is when you talk to politicians about what they think is going on, what do they think is going on on the doorstep, is that when you talk to Conservatives, they say that just everyone is sick to death of us because we keep changing Prime Minister, um, we're rowing amongst ourselves. As evidenced and, by the and, past few yes, weeks. Yes, and, and our voters are just, they're, they're angry at us, so they're maybe not turning out. But some of them would argue they are still listening. So as long as they're angry with you, they're still engaged. What you don't want is when people don't care anymore, OK? But I think part of Labour's success is this argument for change. And mm. that is not necessarily down to change to Keir Starmer. It's about a country that has had the Conservatives in power since 2010. And that's the problem for Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives. And that is the steal, if you like, mm. for Keir Starmer. I mean, no matter what the polls are saying, 20 points ahead and all the rest of it, it doesn't strike me that, that, the, that, that, not Rishi Sunak, that, that Keir Starmer is, is sitting back and no. taking victory no. for granted. In fact, he's, he's actually putting some of his, some of his base on notice mm. with some of the ways in which he has been trying to court, mm. Mm. F if not floating voters, mm. then Conservatives who don't want more of more yeah. of the same. He did a speech on the day that the government uh, managed to get the Rwanda bills through uh, to the next stage of, of voting in the Commons, um, where he kind of made the point like, while they're all fighting, I'm the guy that's ready for government. And in the Q&A, he said that his mentality, and I thought this was so tone, was like, I am telling my shadow cabinet and all the people in my team think like we're five points behind. Mm. We go into this election like we're five points behind. And what that, if he can pull it off with the party, what it creates is this discipline, right? Where they're not gonna be knocked off course oh. and, um, that, I think, has been a big strength of his. But I think the benefit of him, Neil, it's not really Keir, I would say. It's not Starmer, necessarily. It's partly because people like Angie Rayner, uh -huh. John Ashworth, uh -huh. Pat McFadden, Bridget... They, okay, they, okay. they I get, don't I want to not be in government, so they'll no. do whatever it takes. Yeah, but it's, to, not, it's, to, not, but it's, not, but it's not those that he has to worry about, though, is it? It's the, the large chunk of his party well, that is not particularly happy with the stance that he has taken over wow. Margaret Thatcher, the large chunk of his party that is not happy with the stance that he has taken over a ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza no, conflict. But, but, but I think that for, for Starmer, having those internal fights in the party is not necessarily a bad thing when it comes to voters, right? Mm. Is, is, reason, is, is that, just the, the is that reason, what just usually happens within Labour? You've got the well, old school left, you've got the modernising centre, well, never the twins yeah, meet well, except look, in a fight. Historically, it was like, you know... Be that with Kinnock, mm -hmm. be that with Blair and the Clause 4 moment, be that with Starmer now on antisedonism or Gaza. It's kind of like you you almost have to sort of disown a chunk of your party or have a fight mm -hmm. with them to prove to an electorate. And I would say in England, I would say in England, not Scotland, but in England, it's a small C country. Yeah? It's mm -hmm. a small conservative, small C conservative country, right? It's harder. Like Labour have all the path to victory for Labour, you know, I don't need to tell you this. It always <laughs> runs through, through Scotland, yep. right? Because it's 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 by its nature a more progressive, socially liberal, um, socially democratic country. So it's more to the left, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, he's got to he in a way, like Blair won on the centre, he feels he has to attack to the right. But I think in terms of the divisions in the party, 
sort of part of my themes as I think about going into elections are about divisions on both sides. With the Conservatives, we've talked about divisions over immigration, divisions again between left mm -hmm. and right, a fight for the soul of the party that if they lose, do they move to a right-wing leader? Do they stay in the centre ground? All of this stuff. He's got divisions too, Starmer, mm -hmm. between the, the, the centrists and those that are seeking power and the Blairites, if you like, and the left of the party. But the thing is, at the moment, he can just ignore the left. He can just, when he gets into power, mm -hmm. if they win, depending on his majority, he might have a bit of a nightmare because there might be 50 strong. I mean, part of the problem, Neil, when they were worrying about people resigning over his stance on Gaza was they couldn't fill the jobs, right? He doesn't have enough MPs to fill the jobs. Scotland does become incredibly important yeah. at this point in an electoral yeah. cycle. And it's it's been interesting, of course, watching what has been happening there because the SNP have not been having it all their own way, despite the fact, of course, they have a new leader in the shape of uh, Hamza Youssef. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a... I'm obsessed with Scotland. I mean, not only the people, <laughs> yeah, okay. Calm down, Beth. The landscape, the person in front of me mm. who is from Scotland. No, I am obsessed with Scottish politics at the moment because I think it's going to be so critical um, to the general election. Because if Starmer can really take seats in Scotland, the path to power to number 10 becomes so much easier for him. He doesn't have mm. to win what are, you know, as I was talking about, small C conservative seats yep. in England. And if you look back to all Labour governments, they've always done it through getting the bulk of the seats in Scotland. And then, of course, the SNP came along uh, and they just built a stronghold there. A remarkable a, a, force. A, a, a remarkable force uh, and just, like, killed Labour off in mm. Scotland. And now what we're seeing... It's this resurgence of Labour um, and it's going to be one of the key battlegrounds of um, the 2024, we think. If you look at the graphs, you know, from 2020 to now, you've got SNP here going downwards and you have Labour here going upwards and they're not meeting yet in the middle. Mm, no. But goodness me, like SNP in 2020 are polling in their mid 40s. Labour is polling under 20 percent. Mm. And now you've got Labour around 30 percent and the SNP in the low 40s. Right. On some polls, Labour a couple of points behind a couple of some cut 10. So Labour are now looking at it. They've got two seats and they only just won one of those in a by They won one seat out of what is it, 59 mm -hmm. in Scotland in the last general election. I mean, it's absolutely abysmal. But now they're looking at the idea that they could win 25 up to 30 seats. It, it looks possible. So when then? When is this election going to be? Um, I, yeah, I don't like to put our correspondents oh, or editors oh. on the spot here, but it strikes me you get two options. Well, you've got spring, summer, or you've got autumn next yeah. year. Yeah, and uh, um, on the night of the budget um i had from a conservative figure um some information about um at cchq conservative campaign headquarters um them being put on election footing from january the first like you need to be election ready from january the first and this kind of set the cat amongst the pigeons because everyone went general election in may mm. um and in that uh, so that was quite a sort of arresting moment. But within my analysis of that onto election footing is, yes, it could be in May, but there are many movable factors. I think a lot of it depends on polling, mm -hmm. on the economy. Rwanda bill. On Rwanda bill and, and how it's looking for a prime minister. Now, if you talk to Labour strategists, they think it's coming in May. If you talk to people in number 10... They will say, look, we're, we're, we're aiming for an autumn election. And I think that I, I think either I think either could play out, Neil. And I'm but, but what I, if... I, because because think about it like this. If you're the prime minister and it gets to March, April next year and you ran a bill, it's going through and uh, the economy is improving and the tax cuts from January have come in and your polling is narrowed from uh, 20 points behind Labour to 10 points, you might think, I'm going to go now, 
before I have local elections where I could do really badly, or I'll, I'll do Pondo the same day, yep. and before we have another summer of boat crossings, yep. for example. Okay, okay, so, fair enough. But what are, what are the Conservatives' propensity for self-immolation? The well, idea that the Conservatives might, and because they have been talking about this, might elect another leader of the party yep. and therefore well, Prime Minister. No, but then, it's not beyond the realms of possibility, no, I think, which is insane. Well, I think also the other, the other discussion and all of that, right, is there's another scenario where there's an early election and it's from a p position of even further weakness, not strength. So my scenario there about you decide as PM to go earlier than maybe you are planning for is because, you know, the, 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 the cards are in your favour. There's also a scenario whereby, you know, it gets really, really difficult for him next year. I mean, the polling is so bad. You talked about his favourability, right? Mm. The only person that has had worse favourability ratings than him is Liz Truss. I mean, they're really bad. Neil, they're really bad. And it was all the let Rishi be lit Rishi and we're going to stabilise the polls. It's the exact opposite. So what I'm saying is, mm. say you have a scenario where he's stuck in the mud over Rwanda, the party's in open revolt, he's has a you know potential confidence issue where they either put the letters in to trigger a vote or he turns the Rwanda bill into a, a confidence issue. Your, your your eyes have widened. Well, because you're, you're basically way. just telling me I'm not be able to take any holiday for the next twelve. We've months. discussed it anyway. The point is, is you could see him just trigger an election and say you know back me or sack me or I'm going to put it to the people. Um, I have not booked any holiday in Easter. I'm not leaving the country until August because you know they're not going to have like try to try to go and canvas people on the, in their summer holidays in August <laughs> and that is a Never. sure way to lose their vote so but I'm not I, I'm not booking any holiday Neil have you? Uh, no I haven't that's but that, good but that's, that's, we're going to be doing this a lot we, we, we are and I look forward to it well Beth uh, wishing you all the best for 2024 thank thanks too. for all your contributions in 2023 hope you get a bit of time off yourself thank you uh, and that is your lot for this special political edition of the Sky News Daily. You can find out much, much more on everything that Beth was talking about there. Just scroll back through the podcast feed. We'll see you again soon.